Okay, well, I think um, that that is a moment for, for us to start. Welcome to everyone. Um, this week begins our Brunel Research Festival for 2022, celebration of our research that we conduct uh, within the university, but also in collaboration with other people and an opportunity as we uh, do for this session to invite um, our friends uh, and, um, and learned scholars to give us an insight into their own work that has a connection with some of the work that we do. Um, my name is Louise Mansfield. I'm a professor of sport health and social sciences at Brunel and I co-direct the Centre for Health and Wellbeing across the life course with my colleague Christina Victor, who is here and who also ran a session this morning on ageing. Um, and we are absolutely delighted to be hosting the first open lecture of the research festival for this year with Professor Alexander Betts from Oxford University. Um, Alex is Professor of Forced Migration and International Affairs. He's William Golding Senior Fellow in Politics at Brasenose College and he's Associate Head of the Social Science Division at the University of Oxford. He also directs the Economic and Social Research Council doctoral training programme that Brunel um, is a partner of. Um, and I've been uh, privileged to know Alex through that work over the past few years. Um, but he comes today to bring us a wealth of insight and expertise um, around what is really his main research focus on the political economy of refugee assistance and the focus of his work is in Africa. I'm going to hand straight over to Alex, um, who will um, give us what I know will be a really, really insightful uh, talk. And he'll talk for around 40 minutes and then he's going to field some questions uh, from the group. And if you want to put your questions in the chat, I'll make sure that those get to him as well. So, Alex, um, I hand over to you and thank you. Thanks so much, Louise. Um, I'm really delighted to join you. Very excited about the Brunel Research Festival that you're hosting. Um, and as Louise said, um, I've had some experience of interaction with um, doctoral students at Brunel and really enjoyed that in the context of leading the Grand Union DTP with, with Louise. Um, so really happy to be able to speak to you. I'm going to talk to you about my recent book, which is called The Wealth of Refugees, How Displaced People Can Build Economies. Um, I'm going to tell you about what's in the book, but I'm also going to get to the end of the lecture and try to relate the findings of the book to what it means for the UK um, in light of recent trends in refugee policy in the UK, um, but also reflect a little bit on what it means for the role of the university. Um, I think a festival like this is a, an opportunity to think about how research connects to practice and what the role of universities is within that. So I'll, I'll conclude with a few more general insights, hopefully, and then look forward to Q&A. So the, the book's title, The Wealth of Refugees, is a play on the title of another book, the Wealth of Nations, um, written by Adam Smith, which was arguably the founding treaties of modern economics written in 1776. Um, and it's a reflection of the fact that in the intervening 250 years, economics has paid relatively little attention to the economic lives of people who fall outside the nation state, whether as refugees or exiles. And so in a sense, this work is trying to correct that and draws upon a lot of research in that area. But like Adam Smith's The Wealth of Nations, this isn't just a book which has a focus purely on economics. It's also a reflection like Smith's book on the politics, um, the ethics, and the policy implications that flow from the work. It's trying to answer a central and challenging question. What does it mean to create sustainable refugee policies in the contemporary and future world. Faced with rising numbers and rising needs, how can we reconcile that and create policies at a global level that are gonna meet the needs of refugees, provide protection, long-term solutions, but be sustainable given the political pushback against refugees and migration as a whole? Um, just trying to move my slides on, there we go. Um, so just to say a little bit about the contents, the book divides into four parts and they logically sequence one from the other. So the first part of the book starts with ethics, what is right. The second part moves to economics to ask what works to achieve what is right. The third part moves to politics to ask once we know what we want to achieve, what's right, once we know what works to achieve that, how can we persuade those in power and those with interests to do those things? And the fourth part focuses on policy, what's next? 
So in a way, I see these as the kind of questions that anyone in this area or another who wants as a researcher to change policy and practice needs to go through. What's right? What works to achieve what's right? What persuades people to implement what works to achieve what's right? And what do we do with that on a policy level? So I try to engage with that from an interdisciplinary perspective. And the broad area I'm interested in is what might be called the refugees and development agenda. So rather than thinking about refugees as simply vulnerable people in need, although many are, it tries to think about the capabilities of refugees and say beyond the immediate emergency phase, when people need food, clothing, shelter and humanitarian relief, what kind of development response can support them long term? Because around the world, many refugees, the majority in fact, get stuck in intractable limbo. They get stuck in what are called protracted refugee situations, often being housed in camps or settlements for five years, 10 years, 15 years, 20 years. And it's not enough to just provide them with food, clothing and shelter. They need access to jobs, education, sustainable opportunities to integrate, to acquire skills until they can go home. So it's that development space that I'm really interested in. And that link between refugees and development is not a new area. It's often been described as relatively new by UN agencies and NGOs, but it's a very old area. As early as the League of Nations High Commissioner for Refugees between the First World War and the Second World War, these approaches were being used by the League of Nations High Commissioner for Refugees to support people fleeing the collapsed Ottoman Empire, including what's today Syria, um, in countries like Greece to access land, to access jobs, to access training, so that they can make contributions where they are. But of course, this is an agenda which is not just about development economics, it's an agenda which is deeply enmeshed in politics. And so I want to describe a little bit of that. I also want to highlight that this is research that I haven't done alone. It's been collaborative research with a number of colleagues in Oxford. I work with a senior economist, a senior anthropologist, um, and I also work with a very large team of researchers in all of the main field sites, often refugees and people with lived experience of displacement and members of the host community. And this work wouldn't be possible without that collaborative engagement of the over 200 people that contributed to this book. So I, I think that's very important to know. So what are the premises of the book? The first is that we live in what I describe as an age of displacement. And what I mean by that is relatively simple that this is going to be one of the defining issues of our time, the defining issue of the 21st century. We see rising numbers of displaced people, and yet on the other hand, declining political will. So a premise is that we've got to kind of square that circle somehow. We know that numbers are going up because the numbers of displaced people in the world are a product of conflict, authoritarianism, and fragile states. We see increasing numbers of fragile states, often fragile for different reasons, Yemen, South Sudan, Afghanistan, Iraq, Venezuela, Syria, um, the invasion of Ukraine, um, all very different reasons, but fragility is a real challenge. And the world is not very good at collectively putting back together chronically fragile states. Think about Somalia, chronically challenged since the conflict broke out in 1991, the ongoing cycles of conflict in South Sudan, in Afghanistan and elsewhere. And so with that, people, flee across borders in search of basic rights. But also climate change is a major challenge and it has implications for displacement. The World Bank estimates that by 2050, there could be well over 150 million people displaced, mainly internally as a direct result of climate change. And those numbers could grow and they're just estimates. But on the other hand, we see declining political will from Europe, and the rise of populist nationalism in 2016, the closure of borders to refugees in the UK, Denmark's passing of legislation to um, return Syrian refugees back to their home country, the rise of extraterritorial processing attempts by Australia on the island of Nauru, policies by the UK to process um, and transfer refugees and deport them to Rwanda, it is not an auspicious time for refugee rights. So we see rising numbers and yet declining political will. And it's not just declining political will in the rich world, but often poor countries as well, uh, restricting refugee rights from, from Bangladesh to Kenya. But the second premise of, of this work is that refugees can be contributors. 
They are not an inevitable burden on their host societies as they're often portrayed to be by the media or by politicians. All of these photos come from just one group of camps, the Kakuma refugee camps in uh, Northwest Kenya near the South Sudanese border. And there's around 180,000 people live in those camps that were created um, in the early 1990s. And they host um, Congolese refugees, South Sudanese refugees, some Burundians, some Somalis, a diverse and multicultural group of people. And you find markets, you find people buying and selling everything you could imagine um, from basic needs to, to sports equipment. You can find football boots, you can find trainers, um, you can find mobile phones, you can find laptops, you can rent equipment, you find artist studios, you find markets, you find small scale agriculture, even in an arid landscape. And fascinatingly about Kakuma, something that constantly brings me back to Kakuma, is the level of sport. 700 football teams, including a representative team, Kakuma United, um, that now plays in the Kenyan League and has players go on to the professional league. So a fascinating environment. Kakuma has provided half of the refugee Olympic team. So across the board, economic, social, cultural, and even in sport, refugees have capabilities. And this isn't just unique to the context I work in, it's global. And if you think about it, it's intuitive. Refugees are a cross section of the population who have been forced to flee. They cover the cross section of humanity and bring skills and talents, but often through their experiences, a lot of resilience. So I start with ethics and I ask, what do sustainable refugee policies look like from a normative perspective? And I situate it in the ethical tradition of what's called non-ideal theory. So ideal theory would ask, in an ideal world, uh, what should things look like? And, and in this context, in an ideal world, there would be no conflict, there would be perfect substantive democracies around the world, all countries would open their borders up liberally, and all refugees would have access to rights. But a non-ideal theory starts with political constraints. It tries to think through what can we achieve in the real world given those constraints, given the nature and dominance of the nation state, the Westphalian state system, given that states and democracies and non-democracies seek to be accountable to their own citizens, and citizens often feel the competition of rights with non-citizens, what can we change in a real world? So I then lay out three criteria for sustainability and say sustainable refugee policies that endure over time, that are not going to experience the kind of backlash we saw in 2016, the kind of backlash we experience around the world, need to achieve three things. Firstly, and most crucially, rights. They have to respect human rights law and international refugee law, humanitarian law, deliver protection, which basically means all rights under international law, assistance, meeting people's basic needs, um, but also allowing them to live dignified lives, including public services like education and health and solutions, not being in limbo indefinitely, but getting access to either going home to the country in which they're a citizen or a pathway to new citizenship in another country, whether the immediate host country or resettlement to a third country. But secondly, politics. To make this work, we have to have policies that can be supported locally, nationally and internationally. What we see is when we don't have that, we get backlash and we reach thresholds. There's not always an inevitability to that. It depends on responsible leadership by politicians, creating narratives, having good advocacy. We can shift the boundaries of this, but politics is a key part of this, whether we like it or not. And scale. We need to deliver protection to large numbers of people over time because this is going to get more challenging. And there are three broad mechanisms for allocating displaced people and responsibility to states. Spontaneous arrival, where people choose where they go. Resettlement, where people are relocated uh, to third countries, say from camps in the Middle East or Africa to the UK or Europe, and going to neighboring countries. And I think a really important premise is all of these have an important and unique role to play. They all do something different. They can't be perfect substitutes for one another. So asylum is threatened in the UK. And the right to asylum is really important. It's a last resort for people who can't get protection elsewhere, but it's also really important for people who become refugees to your class, whose circumstances change while they're out of the country and can't be expected to go home. So it's also politically important as a symbol that 
Refugee protection is a shared global responsibility. If the UK doesn't contribute to asylum, why should Kenya? Why should Uganda? Why should Jordan? Why should Lebanon? So it's really important. Resettlement matters because it enables some of the most vulnerable people who can't be safe in camps or cities around the world to get an alternative route to move to a rich country and receive the needs they have. They might have health needs. They might be persecuted for particular reasons, even in camps. That pathway is an important one. And alternative pathways like family reunification visas, education visas, um, labor migration visas can enable refugees to move from camps or cities around the world to get opportunities through those so-called alternative pathways. But the reality, despite that, is that the overwhelming majority of refugees are in immediate neighboring countries. Until the Ukraine crisis, at least, some 85% of the world's refugees were hosted by low and middle income countries. And the overwhelming majority simply move across the border into the neighboring country. Now, most don't have the means to embark on long journeys. Despite the media focus on smugglers and networks and movement from the south to the north, this is not the reality for most of the world's refugees. The reality is moving across one border to a neighboring country, generally in uh, the global south. And so that's where a lot of my research primarily focuses. And with my teams of researchers, we focused on three countries, Ethiopia, Kenya, and Uganda. And this is where the book's focus mainly lies. Now, why these three countries? Well, they're not negligible in terms of the number of refugees hosts. So until not long before the Ukraine crisis, these three countries hosted the same number of refugees broadly as the whole of the European Union. So they hosted the same number of refugees as the entire EU 27, despite being amongst the poorest countries in the world. And in those countries, we focused on the capital cities, Addis, Nairobi, Kampala, but also one camp or settlement or group of camps or settlement in each country, Doloado in Ethiopia, Kakuma in Kenya, and Nachivali in Uganda. And they offer a, a, an interesting source of variation. So Uganda lets refugees work and gives them significant freedom of movement. Kenya pretty much does the opposite. It makes refugees live in camps and denies them the right to work. And Ethiopia is gradually moving from legislation that's similar to Kenya's towards starting to open up the right to work and freedom of movement, albeit slowly. So there's variation in the regulation and what opportunities it provides. But they've also got things in common. They're in the same region, in a very dangerous neighborhood, neighboring conflict and crisis, um, but they also host some similar populations. So in all countries, we were able to look at Somali refugees, in two at Congolese refugees, and also look at some different populations like Ethiopians and Burundians in, in Kenya to get some diversity. The research was participatory. We start with qualitative research before sequencing to quantitative research, experiment methods. We do focus groups, we engage with communities, and we also try to involve refugees as researchers, peer researchers, enumerators to provide training in research methods, and sometimes to publish our work in the language. So this report was Refugee Economies in Doloado. And we realized that a lot of our dissemination was focusing on international organizations, NGOs, business, the outside world. But actually refugees wanted to know what we were doing. And because it was about their economy and many were business leaders, entrepreneurs, they wanted to know where the opportunities were. So we had one of our reports translated into Somali and did launch events for it in each of the five Doloado camps. It's not perfect. We'd like to be more radical in our approach to inclusive research. And we're trying to do some things in that area, which I'll describe but there's an attempt to be participatory throughout the work. One of the exciting things about the quant work is we did a really wide ranging survey. Um, there's been very little work on the economic lives of refugees. And so we wanted to look at correlations across lots of areas. So we collected a wide range of data, basic demographic data, identification, covering households, looking at networks. So for instance, in the networks module, we covered family networks, access to social protection, including through networks and remittances, relationships in the place that they're living, access to credit and savings, the use of technologies like mobile phones, mobility, social participation, connections in the past, we covered modules on economic shocks and household history, the regulatory environment and access to aid and services, subjective well-being and a series of indicators of well-being, mental health, physical health. We even collected data on sports participation so that we could look at that and correlate it with a number of other things. So 
wide ranging so that we could have a degree of openness to what we wanted to cover in, in our subsequent work. So hopefully a really useful data set. And it's a large data set with over 16,000 respondents um, covering not just one wave of data collection, but in the case of Kenya, we went back two years later and repeated our data collection to see what had changed over time. Uh, we covered both refugees and host communities across the sites. Um, and we did random sampling to collect in representative ways, sometimes having to build our own sample frame. So sometimes we could use UNHCR data as the sample frame in camps. Sometimes it was out of date or in urban areas wasn't available. So to do that, we mobilized communities, sometimes used satellite images and built a map from which we could randomly sample within the communities to get representative data of those communities. We've used the research to ask three main questions, all of which are fundamentally important to thinking about the design of sustainable refugee policies. That's kind of what they have in common. First set of questions have been about welfare. When do refugees thrive or only survive? In other words, when do they do better? When do they do worse in terms of income, wealth, expenditure, mental health, physical health, subjective well-being? A second set of questions about social cohesion. When do refugees and hosts get on? Uh, what explains host community attitudes towards refugees? What explains refugee attitudes towards host communities? What explains when um, there's positive interaction versus negative interaction? And mobility, when do refugees stay or go? When do they move on from camps to cities? When do they move across a border? When do they move on longer journeys and travel? And broadly, what we find across each of these three questions is education and the right and opportunity to engage in meaningful work matter for all of them. So that, if you like, is the crude headline, but there's a lot of nuance behind that. Having education and the right to work makes refugees better off. It makes host communities more likely to be sympathetic to the presence of refugees, and it reduces the aspiration and actual movement of people beyond the areas where they are based. So let me just go through and rather than give you a full account of the book, I want to give you 10 insights, 10 big takeaways from the social science that I think matter for the social science, but also matter for the policy and practice. First is a poverty trap. We find that there's a systematic gap between refugees, welfare, and host communities. Refugees are systematically worse off than the surrounding people that host them. Now that's a really important finding because a lot of people ask when we do this research, they say, if you're doing research in poor communities, aren't refugees just the same as everyone else? And actually, no, there's a systematic gap, a poverty trap that results from being a refugee compared to those citizens that live in the same surrounding areas. Um, and so if we compare, for instance, across income, employment, subjective well-being, food security, health, mental health, we see gaps. And the stars indicate that those gaps a statistically significant at a 95% confidence interval. Um, and so we see those gaps with only a few exceptions. So we see exceptions, for instance, um, in certain areas um, such as uh, Kenya's Kakuma camps, where refugees are better off in terms of income than the host community, and it's statistically significant. And that's because the Kakuma camps are in a very poor area in which the surrounding indigenous Takana population are almost absolutely dependent upon uh, presence of the refugee camps for jobs, for income, for assistance. So we find that refugees are generally worse off with the exception of Takana County. And I think that's important because it suggests that this is a distinctive area for study by development studies, by development economists with a particular set of needs. Why might there be that difference? Well, institutionally, the population often has access to different rights and opportunities, such as the denial of the right to work, the denial of the right to freedom of movement, facing prejudice in terms of access to jobs. Refugees are treated differently, and so they tend to have different degrees of economic opportunity. Second insight, social cohesion. One of the really exciting things about the data set is we asked questions of both refugees and the host community, and we asked them both about the frequency and quality of their interactions with one another, but also their attitudes towards one another. So we're able to correlate attitudes that the host community have towards refugees with the number of interactions. 
And there's a theory across social science called contact theory, which suggests that as um, in groups interact with out groups, they develop more sympathy and trust towards them. So the more you interact with people different from you, the more you empathize and sympathize with them and the better your perception of them. So we try to look at that in this context by seeing what explains host community attitudes towards nearby refugees. And one of the most important things we find in the correlations at least is that interaction matters, having a business exchange, having a conversation, participating in a shared social activity can break down those barriers and build trust. Now, of course, the causal direction of that is challenging to work out. There's, there's what social scientists call endogeneity. So we use what social scientists call an instrumental variable effect to control for the causality. And we find that at least in the cities, there still appears to be some causal relationship where interaction drives more positive attitudes. But it's not just intergroup interaction that matters. We also find intragroup attitude formation is really important. So people's attitudes towards refugees are highly correlated by their immediate neighbors and their family members. You tend to believe what those closest to you also believe. So this means that if we want to change attitudes, we need to work at a neighborhood level on narrative change, but we also need to encourage interaction between refugees and the hosts, make them part of the same livelihoods projects, make them part of the same sports activities, whatever it may be. We also find there are key differences between urban and camp contexts. Um, host communities in urban areas are more suspicious, we find, of um, refugees than in urban areas, and they tend to be more sceptical on economic grounds, whereas in the rural areas they're more worried about security and a threat to security, but they're generally more welcoming. And I think that's partly because the economic contribution in areas that host camps and settlements is much more recognised, much more important, and much more welcome. Third insight, the right to work makes a huge difference to refugees. So our data set allows us to compare outcomes between Uganda, where the right to work exists, and Kenya, where the right to work doesn't. And we can look at outcomes for the same nationality groups, Somalis and Congolese, and control for other variables. And we find that controlling for those other variables, simply the fact of being in Uganda is associated with 16% higher income levels at purchasing power parity. And that seems to suggest that the right to work, the regulation of the state, shapes economic outcomes um, for refugees. We also develop qualitative and some quantitative evidence that suggests that the host community is better off. So in Kampala, refugees are creating jobs, often for host community members. They're creating businesses that employ nationals of the host community. So a real contribution through the right to work and the right to own a business, for instance, being key rights. Fourth insight, migration and mobility. In Europe, we constantly hear a narrative that everyone wants to come to Europe. Now, first of all, most refugees are not in the rich world. They're mainly in low and middle income countries. But secondly, um, only a tiny proportion of refugees are moving onwards from countries like tech Kenya to Europe, less than 0.1% in any given year. And we know this because what we were able to do in Kenya is go and do our surveys and then go back to the Kakuma camps in Nairobi as a time lag and interview them later, go back to the same families and households. And as you'd expect, after two years, three years, some of those people were no longer there. They'd moved on. So we were able to go to neighbours and say, where have they moved to? Or contact them through WhatsApp and say, where have you moved to? And that allowed us to start with a general, a general representative sample and ask what proportion are moving on and where are they going? So we know how many people move on secondarily from this first country of asylum to a different destination. And we know that refugees from this are highly mobile. About 8% a year were changing their residency. But most were either moving within a camp or within a city, um, or between a camp and city. Or if they were going abroad, it was mainly across the border from Kenya to Uganda. A tiny proportion were moving on to Europe. And most movements, even international movements, were regular. They were what we colloquially call legal movements. They weren't the classic move on with smugglers. Now, of course, we found very high levels of aspiration to move onwards to Europe. A lot of people wanted to move onwards to Europe, but actual movement was tiny. We also correlated some of those aspirations for movement and actual movements with characteristics of those people who were moving and not moving. And one of the things we found was data that challenges a relationship in the social science data called the migration hump. The migration hump is the idea that up to a certain point, as people get richer, 
they actually aspire to migrate even more. And this challenges the sort of European policy idea that as people get richer, they're less likely to move onwards. But that migration hump relationship, we don't find for this data for refugees. The data suggests actually that as people get access to greater assets, for instance, as they get access to economic opportunity, they may actually be less likely to choose to move onwards. So actually, if we make people better off, they're likely to remain in situ. The people moving from Kenya to Uganda, for instance, were often those that had significant gaps in terms of key welfare indicators. Fifth insight, self-reliance. Self-reliance is the buzzword of refugee policy. There's an aspiration which is in something called the Global Compact on Refugees, agreed by the international community, espoused by the UN Refugee Agency in 2018, that refugees should become independent of aid as quickly as possible. And there's an element of that that's really good, jobs, education, socioeconomic rights. But the UN definition of self-reliance is to become independent of aid at an individual level, a household level, a community level. And self-reliance programs get rolled out, livelihoods programs. But what we found in our work is that unless these remote economies are built systematically at a macroeconomic level, self-reliance programs do very little. So the Kalabaye settlements, which are a new settlement next to the Kakuma camps in uh, Kenya, were created in 2016. And what we did was follow the economic lives of newly arrived South Sudanese in Kalabaye, a new settlement where people were given the right to work, access to markets, degree of freedom of movement, market-based opportunity in the name of self-reliance, and South Sudanese newly arrived integrated in the old Kakuma camp. So it allowed us to compare, if you like, the difference between a market-based self-reliant settlement and an old-fashioned humanitarian delivery settlement and see what difference it made. And we actually found it made some difference, but relatively little difference. The people in Calabaye, very few of them had an independent income generating activity after two years, about 6%. Fewer than 2% identified as independent of aid two years out. And that's because even these programs are still circulating a finite amount of aid rather than building infrastructure. Calabaye, like Kakuma, lacks roads, lacks electricity, lacks decent water supply. Without those things, you don't get investment, you don't get business presence, you don't get the possibility for the economy to grow in a way that realistically expands economic opportunity. So self-reliance without large-scale investment and economic growth is, is a bit of um, a, a fantasy ideal. It's not that it's wrong, but we need to nuance how we think about it. We also did some work through impact evaluation on cash-based assistance. Cash-based assistance is one of the, the, the sort of really trendy areas of development economics to shift from in-kind aid like food delivery to just giving people money. And Calabaye embarked on a transition from in-kind aid, food, towards, um, uh, restricted cash assistance, giving people vouchers that they could spend on food and basic needs in designated retail outlets, and finally moving to unrestricted cash, giving people money they could spend on anything. And what we did was do research at each stage of that to look at the impact. And we found that generally there were huge benefits to cash-based assistance. But some of those benefits espoused by the policy and programmatic communities were misleading. So the problem was we found 89% of households in Calabaye had significant household debt, owing an average of half of their overall annual expenditure. So half, most of them had, on average, half of their annual income, if you like, in debt. And that meant that that debt was often held by retail shops where they would go and buy on credit, but not be able to repay it. And one of the premises of cash-based assistance is you have choice, you choose who you buy from. But of course, if you're in debt to a given retailer, you don't get that choice. And so you're tied to that particular retailer, which undermines some of those benefits. And this was an area that, for instance, the World Food Programme, the UN Refugee Agency was largely unaware of, that household debt is so high and it distorts the kind of market dynamics of freedom of choice. Seventh big insight, cities versus camps. We often assume, I suppose, that refugees are better off in cities than camps. Camps are horrible things. Uh, they often warehouse people for long periods of time, they provide basic assistance, but not much more. Our research suggests that there's some nuance to that, that refugees in cities have higher incomes, higher asset levels, and higher unemployment employment rates. They do better on basic economic criteria, but they seem to be worse off 
in terms of subjective well-being and physical and mental health. That's because it's very tough being in cities. Refugees face prejudice. They often have to give up access to assistance. They struggle to overcome discrimination. They're often in the informal economy. And so I think we need to take those insights and not say it's cities or camps, but build opportunities in rural areas that move beyond encampment and create settlements, build opportunities in urban areas, and recognize that as we found in our work, that there's complex household selection between cities and camps. Some people move back from cities to camps. Some people split their households between cities and camps. So there's complexity in those dynamics. Eighth insight, we're able to use our correlations to look at what explains outcome in terms of, outcomes in terms of economic indicators. For instance, take income levels. We found that there were a series of statistically significant variables that explain variation in refugees' incomes. Employment, education, access to networks, gender is huge, um, holding other factors constant, gender makes a huge difference in people's uh, income levels, women are systematically worse off. We also know from other research that gender disparities are greater within the refugee community than the immediate host community. So there's something about being a refugee woman where the intersectionality shapes the degree of economic disparity and exclusion. Nationality matters. Some nationalities do better just by being from that nationality. So there's a Somali dummy variable, if you like, that seems to explain greater economic success, even holding other things con constant. And country of origin matters because of the regulatory framework. We've done similar research to look at other indicators of, of um, refugee welfare and host community welfare. A ninth insight is what are called cooperatives. We did an impact evaluation on a really pioneering area of work led by the IKEA Foundation. So there's been a lot of discussion about the role the private sector can play in refugee assistance. And the IKEA Foundation put 100 million US dollars into five relatively recent camps on the Ethiopia-Somali border, the Doloardo camps. And some of their interventions have been successful, others less successful. But one of the things that's been quite successful is cooperatives, which can be defined as group-based income generating activities. And what's exciting about them is they integrate both refugees and the immediate host community. They give them access to training and credit in areas like livestock, energy, agriculture, give them the tools they need, but aspire to gradually enable them to be sustainable over time, to allow, allow small businesses and cooperatives to continue and generate livelihoods in an area where refugees traditionally couldn't work, but the Ethiopian government has come to see the potential through its experience of these schemes. We found that these schemes generally improved income levels for refugees and hosts and led to improved relations between refugees and hosts. The key to success though, was market linkages. There had to be a demand in the nearby region. There had to be value chains present. And too often when humanitarian or development programs are designed in camps, they're designed based on learning globally, saying, okay, let's design a program for refugee tailors or beekeepers. And they're divorced from any understanding of the local market or local supply chains and value chains. Understanding the market linkages and value chains was crucial to explaining some of the successes here around, for instance, the livestock value chains, this huge demand for camel milk, camel meat, for instance. But some of the failures were around um, energy cooperatives that tried to sell um, um, types of briquette for stove burning when particular types of energy and firewood were more commonly used by households. So looking at and understanding demand and supply in the regional economic context is crucial. A tenth insight, which is something that international organizations often miss, is there are transnational livelihoods. Refugees' economies are transnational. They're not just bound by a particular place. A big source of capital and investment for refugee entrepreneurs comes from remittances, and they're very important. But we also found, for instance, that we shouldn't romanticize the role of remittances, that they um, are often correlated with lower levels of employment, controlling for other variables, which suggests a degree of dependency effect, that the households that receive remittances often are outside the labor market. Where cause and effect lies, we can't make a judgment because we haven't looked at it in a way that controls for endogeneity. But we also find crucial cross-border movements. So in the Doloardo camps, um, you can see on this satellite map, the Doloardo town, which straddles the two sides of the border alongside a river. Refugees are constantly moving backwards and forwards, um, illicitly between Ethiopia and Somalia. For a long time, they couldn't work in Ethiopia. There are major restrictions on their market access, but often they don't land on the Somali side of the border. 
or they'd go back to the internal displacement camps in Somalia to access cash assistance and receive whatever benefits they could and bring that back across the border. Sometimes, sometimes staying for several months in Somalia, but then coming back just at the point where they would be crossed off the list for food rations. And this sounds in a way as though it could be duplicitous, but it's a very rational strategy. If you've got minimal access to assistance, limited and constrained economic opportunity, maximizing that by moving backwards and forwards across borders is a very sensible thing to do. And it's not just something we see in this border, but across many of the sites in which we work. Another aspect of the work that I want to mention that I look at quite closely at the book is the politics of all this and the politics of these self-reliant schemes that I've said have become so important for international organizations. And it's really important to put this in historical context. So for example, there's been a real celebration around the world of Uganda's self-reliance policies, that Uganda lets refugees work and gives them a freedom of movement. It also gives refugees plots of land to cultivate. And there's so much that's positive about that. But if we want to replicate it, I don't think we can be naive. We need to understand the political and historical context in which such policies and legislation have emerged. And the newspaper article you see celebrating Uganda's refugee policies actually comes from the mid 1960s. And I pulled it out of the UNHCR archives and it's saying triumph for Uganda's refugee policies, all will soon be self-supporting. Uganda has basically allowed refugees a significant amount of freedom since independence in 1962. But many of the policies it's developed, it's developed through illiberal politics. So one of the architects of the settlement model in Uganda, the person who signed Uganda up to the 1951 refugee convention was actually Idi Amin. We don't associate Idi Amin with liberal refugee policies, but at the time he was photographed shaking hands with the UNHCR representative. He was celebrating Uganda signing the refugee convention. And even in the context of his brutal, oppressive persecution of Ugandan Asians, many of whom moved on to the UK and elsewhere, um, there was a use of refugee populations for political purposes. Amin had very little support in Kampala. He had very little support from Buganda, the central area of Uganda. He was originally from a community in what's today South Sudan, and he relied for his cabinet and his military on people from South Sudan and former Zaire. And so he was very supportive of refugees from former Zaire, from Rwanda, from South Sudan. They were crucial. And even today, we see a very complex relationship between global politics, national politics, and local politics. So taking the example of Uganda, the international community wants Uganda to host large numbers of refugees. It hosts 1.4 million. It wants it to be an example of hosting refugees in the region of origin. And so it's prepared to allocate development aid to, Uganda, aid to Uganda. At the national level, President Yuveri Museveni wants that money for legitimacy. Um, Uganda doesn't have a perfect human rights record. It's uh, what it calls a no party democracy. So it's far from being a perfect substantive democracy and it has high levels of corruption. And in some of the work I've done, I've traced some of those networks through which international aid arrives in the capital city and is dispersed through patronage networks to the refugee hosting communities. So there is an ambivalent and complex politics that surrounds all that. And in the book, I tell similar stories for both Kenya and Ethiopia, different stories but areas where the politics and the intersection between the global, the national and the local is what enables refugee rights. Refugee rights is not a neat, tidy and clean politics of values. It's often messy, murky and shrouded in power and interests. What next in terms of policy? Well, in the book, I reflect on a few things. The impact of COVID, by which I'm really referring not to the health impact, but the economic impact, some of which have been lagged. Now, we know that economic recession and economic downturn have particularly detrimental consequences for forced displacement. It affects the causes, the consequences and responses to displacement. So just looking at the social science on the, the correlation between serious economic downturn and a series of variables, we know that global recession exacerbates conflict, exacerbates authoritarianism and exacerbates fragile states. We know that the consequences in receiving societies of economic downturn affect refugees and displaced people's employment. They're in the sectors that are most vulnerable in rich and poor countries. It affects assistance. We've already seen a downturn in multilateral and bilateral aid. DFID, for instance, has made cuts in the UK. 
remittances have been badly affected since COVID-19. But we also see effects from recession on public attitudes, on people's ability to travel with border closure and on human rights. So social science tells us those patterns and already since COVID-19 with a variety of factors, including the invasion of Ukraine, the increasing exclusion of Russia from the global economy, we see a real risk of these economic effects having very damaging effects on the causes, consequences and responses to displacement. So that exacerbates the premise I started with, if you like, of rising needs, but declining political will. In that context, the lessons I think we derive from, from the kind of work I've described are on how to build refugee economies in cities, in rural areas that host large numbers of refugees in Africa and other parts of the world, but also nearer to home in Europe and elsewhere. This is a challenge for us to recognize all of the regions that host refugees, to support refugees with access to employment, access to public services, but also ensure that host communities share in those benefits, that receiving communities also benefit from better healthcare, better access to employment, better access to education for their children. To do that when it comes to a society, whether it's Kenya, Uganda, Colombia, Jordan, Poland, that is receiving large numbers of people, we have to map out the skills that refugees have, but also map out the opportunities. Where are their areas of gaps in um, employment, demand for employment, uh, the supply of jobs in those communities where refugees could have access to those areas? We have to be able to convene all the stakeholders and get buy-in from them. Um, as we've sometimes seen in successful scenarios like the Doloado example I highlighted in Ethiopia, where the UN agencies, the Ethiopian government, the local authorities, business partners came together and tried to look at how to support an area of change in refugees' economic lives. We have to mobilise finance. Yes, that's about donor development aid, but it's also about private finance and leveraging it in creative ways through impact investment, through ways in which um, investors can put money up front and then government donors can pay off based on outcomes, for instance. There's lots of innovation about impact bonds and the role they can play in financial innovation in this space. Um, I've mainly focused in this talk on my research in East Africa. I've also done some research and policy engagement around building refugee economies in the context of the Syrian crisis. I've worked in Jordan. In the Venezuelan crisis, I've worked for a brief time to advise the Colombian government, which um, hosts over one and a half million uh, Venezuelans and has tried to integrate them in the economy. And I've done some policy guidance um, with donor governments relating to the response in frontline states in, on the border with, with Ukraine, for instance. So I'm happy to discuss those in Q&A. A lot of you might be thinking, what are the implications for the UK of this, this sort of global tour of, of the implications from the work? The UK's situation in terms of refugee policy is, is dire. Um, the new Nationality and Borders Bill, which is soon to become an act, effectively makes it illegal to claim asylum in the UK. It shuts down the UK's historical tradition of providing asylum. and means that anyone who doesn't arrive with an appropriate visa can be arrested and deported. We've seen recently a proposal by the Home Secretary um, to work with the government of Rwanda on a so-called migration and economic development partnership to deport um, uh, refugees who come across the English Channel, no matter where they come from, to Rwanda and have Rwanda be responsible for their asylum claim and the protection of refugees, uh, which has been shown to be deeply problematic on many levels, legality, practicality, ethics, um, I think part of the implication of my work is that refugee policy shouldn't just be in the hands of the Home Office. Within a country, it touches upon many areas, housing, employment, health, education, so domestically we need to open up. But internationally, we can engage outwardly. The Foreign, and Commonwealth, Foreign Commonwealth and Development Office that's incorporated DFID needs much more systematic policies for how it thinks and uses evidence-based approaches to development policies within refugee communities. Um, very often it's been leading, DFID has been leading in international development, but there's more that can be done to incorporate evidence and for the FCDO to work with the Home Office and not be dominated by an asylum control agenda, but by one which builds rights and opportunities for refugees around the world. The role of asylum is crucial and it needs to be upheld, but it can also be seen within a broader context 
So the shift I would like to see is from the UK focusing just on an asylum and immigration policy towards having a national refugee policy, a national refugee policy that is at all levels, support for immediate neighboring countries, support for resettlement and alternative pathways, support for asylum and better integration policies beyond the home office that work with local communities. The 1951 convention, lots of people are asking, is it still relevant? The UN Refugee Agency has said the UK's recent policies threaten the existence of the 1951 convention. My position on the convention is that it is um, inadequate, but essential. We have to keep it. We're not at a point where we could possibly abandon it. Some people even from the left have argued for that. Claire Short wrote a letter in the last couple of weeks to the Financial Times arguing that we should renegotiate the convention. And if we can't, that the UK should join with a coalition of the willing to reinvent it. I think everyone recognizes that there are weaknesses in it, weaknesses in a system created in the aftermath of the Second World War, um, but it's inadequate and yet indispensable at the same time. It upholds the right to asylum and ensures courts represent a last um, um, means of ensuring that governments and populist governments uphold their rights, um, but it also upholds the commitment of states around the world to continue to host people even when they are seriously economically challenged themselves. So one thing I'd like to see build um, after the bill has been addressed, after the Rwanda deal has died as it will, a British refugee policy that tries to lay all of these things out. Finally, I said I'd conclude with something about the role of universities. Universities have an important role. Uh, many universities in the country have become university sanctuary. Mine has not yet, and I hope it will become one. Universities of Sanctuary have a role to invite people into their communities, to offer scholarships for refugees and people of displacement backgrounds, to host events, to change narratives, to be available to people with displacement backgrounds who are not part of the university, to open up facilities to organizations that work on behalf of refugees and displaced populations. Um, one thing we have done in Oxford recently though, is support something called the Refugee-Led Research Hub. So I said earlier that I was sort of disappointed that we hadn't gone far enough with our participatory research. When I was last in Kakuma, just before the pandemic, I spoke to one of our research assistants who said he was really grateful that working with us had allowed him to go to university. It had allowed him to pay his student fees for his first year. But he said that it didn't allow him to continue paying for his second year because he worked with us for such a short period of time. And it made me go away and think, how can we build more sustainable, solid relationships with people and support them over time? So in Nairobi, we've created the Refugee-Led Research Hub, um, where I will be um, on Wednesday, um, traveling there tomorrow. Um, and this week we're hosting something called the Refugee-Led Research Festival. The hub has over 40 employees, nearly all of whom are refugees or have lived experience of displacement. And they do research where they lead on all phases of the research. They identify the research questions, set the agenda, design the research, uh, collect the data, do the analysis, publish the research in their own names, um, and disseminate that work. And we support them in Oxford through access to mentorship, lectures, workshops, uh, connections to the funding that can enable that research to take place. We've also tried to build an education program around that with access programs, with fellowships. Um, and we've next year, we're really excited that we've got um, nine offer holders from affiliates of the hub uh, to come to Oxford, many going to other universities around the world. And we're trying to push for more scholarship opportunities and more access opportunities. Um, I think it's really important that universities have a role in research, evidence and insight in this area, and that they balance critique and engagement. Critical research is really important. There is a lot to critique. But I also fervently believe that it's important to engage. I have a lot of discussions with policymakers, with politicians, whether I agree with them or not, I want to be able to work with them and I want my work um, to be able to engage even in that messy and ethically complex world so that hopefully we can make a difference to practice. But I also very much respect people who stay in the space of critique because it's their critique on which constructive engagement can build. So to conclude, what have I said? Around the world, we face rising numbers and declining political will. All countries should ethically support spontaneous arrival asylum, resettlement, and support the neighboring countries that host most refugees. But when we focus on the latter, we need evidence-based approaches to refugees and development. The work we've done with colleagues tries to support that 
There are significant limits to the self-reliance narrative that dominates policy debates. We need to shift from just microeconomic interventions to building economies for refugees and the host communities. And we need to support the right to work, even through recognizing and understanding the complex and ambivalent politics around it. And finally, an area that touches upon another aspect of my work that I also run through this book is about refugee-led governance. We need more refugees in political life to advocate and argue. We also need at the level of camps and cities around the world for refugee-led organizations to access funding, support, recognition, and be able to make a difference. With um, two colleagues, Evan Easton Calabria um, and Kate Pincock, we did another book with Cambridge University Press on refugee-led organizations, trying to highlight the difference they make. And now one of our studies at the hub is a refugee-led study that's trying to expand that to look at Uganda, Tanzania, Ethiopia, uh, and Kenya, and look at the impact that refugee-led organizations make in comparison to international NGOs. Thank you so much for listening, and apologies if I've gone a little over time. If you're interested in the book, um, there's a discount code available. Um, it's not a massively expensive book anyway, but there is a way to get 30% off. Alex, thank you so much. If we were in the room, I'm sure there would be a very loud round of applause. There are some questions coming in. I'm going to start with the ones in the chat, but please, others, um, either just use the reactions to raise your hand or um, it, shout at me, if you like, and I will I will find out where, where you are and field, field your question. I can see your hand, Gemma, but let me just start with the chat because there was a couple of um, in, interchanges around conceptual definitions, Alex, but but probably really quite important to the whole understanding of um, experience. So there's a question about whether mobility of refugees from a country to another, including visiting uh, home countries, does that make them a diaspora rather than a refugee? And I guess, do, does that matter? Does it change the narrative in any way, shape or form? Um, yeah. These are not mutually exclusive categories. Okay. So I think one of the challenges in this area is everyone wants a, a convenient label to identify people with. And actually people's identities are not reducible to their immigration status. And actually on what basis should we describe people? Should it be their immigration status? Should it how be how they self-identify? And on this particular question, I mean, there are refugee diasporas. Um, there are people in the diaspora who happen to be refugees. Um, it doesn't make them any less part of that diaspora, that they have refugee status, that they fled war and persecution doesn't exclude them from being part of the diaspora. But likewise, being part of the diaspora doesn't mean that they can't have a well-founded fear of persecution. That means they have refugee, they are refugees or have refugee status. So these are not mutually exclusive categories. Um, a project that I worked on um, a few years ago was called Mobilizing the Diaspora, How Refugees Challenge Authoritarianism. And it was about refugee diasporas, focusing on Zimbabweans and Rwandans in exile um, in Africa, but also in Europe and North America, and how they mobilized politically as a diaspora to challenge the governments back home. So how Mugabe Zimbabwe was challenged by Zimbabweans in South Africa and um, Botswana and, and across the UK, how Paul Kagame's Rwanda has been challenged by um, the opposition in exile. That, there's no space for opposition politics in Rwanda, or it's very limited. That doesn't extinguish political opposition, but it moves it abroad. So I think often people, and particularly in the media, need that either or sense. If you're X, you can't be Y. Well, actually, all identities are complex and multifaceted. And in this area, we certainly shouldn't have our, our view of people obscured by the labels that governments seek to impose on them and to define as mutually exclusive. Brilliant, thank you. Um, and a question about um, intersectionality, really, Alex. Um, to what extent do race and religion shape refugee experience and state policy? And connected to that, do you think those are key factors in, say, the UK, Australia, or Denmark's recent policy? Massively. Um, so, I mean, this is this is really challenging to kind of um, ascertain in terms of research. Um, they're very difficult variables to kind of operationalize. Um, and that's perhaps why um, a lot of the work has tended to be critical and qualitative rather than, than quantitative. Um, I, I think it's really clear though, that the Ukraine response, um, there are two aspects to it. One is just proximity, that actually, yes, it's on our doorstep. 
and and that creates an immediate need that that we couldn't we couldn't forcibly return Ukrainians or block the border, there would be public backlash. But I think a significant part of public support in the UK and Europe, in contrast to other people who come as asylum seekers to the UK, stems from race, um, and to some extent, to a lesser degree, perhaps religion. But I think one of the big features of um, the Syrian refugee crisis was Islamophobia. Um, and the contrast between predominantly Christian society versus Muslims is huge. The rhetoric in Europe post 2015, 16, um, and in the United States, going back as far as 9-11 is Islamophobic, and that has had clear effects on asylum policies. So what I want to avoid is being overly critical of the very positive public response to Ukrainian refugees. It's brilliant, the solidarity, it's great. But what we need to do is take that solidarity and recognize that it needs to be more widely available and understand collectively the contradictions in that. That I have African refugee friends and colleagues who say, why does no one in Europe care about the people who are losing their lives crossing the Mediterranean? Why does Europe not care about the conflicts that we've had for many generations? Why has it taken something on the doorstep in a predominantly white, predominantly Christian society to mobilize that degree of public support? So these are key dynamics. Um, the challenge, though, is that those that want to believe their key dynamics will, and those that want to deny their important dynamics will. So I guess there's a question of what role researchers can play in more systematically demonstrating the role that structural racism and discrimination play. I also think there are gender dynamics in this, that, um, that the fact that most Ukrainians outside the country are women with children um, plays into a narrative that politicians have created of women and children welcome, men unwelcome. So in the UK's Rwanda policy, it targets single male asylum seekers. So there's a demonization based on gender. And that's, that's not necessarily exclusively bad for men, it also creates a structure of gendered norms and gendered attitudes to displaced populations, which, which is arguably quite problematic. Yeah, thank, thanks, Alex. Uh, Gemma and then Genevieve. Hi, can you hear me? Yeah, perfect. Thank you, Alex. That's a really fascinating talk. Um, my question touches on the other questions and there's really about intersectionality as well. Um, and I noticed in your measurements, you measured physical health and mental health, but I noticed not specifically disability, which arguably isn't a health issue. And I recognize measuring disability is incredibly complex. So I'd, I kind of, it, it's, it's a question, was it purposeful that uh, disability hasn't been included? Yeah, so, the questions we ask around physical and mental health are quite limited. Um, we wanted to keep our survey less than an hour because otherwise yeah. it's just too onerous. And we were primarily interested in um, the economic lives of refugees in that work. But we wanted to be able to explore the factors that relate to that. So mm -hmm. we borrowed from standardized questionnaires developed by the World Health Organization, mm -hmm. um, partly because we didn't have expertise, so we consulted people who did. Mm -hmm. and took standardized questions that have already been rolled out and used in this context to get some indicators. Um, now, I believe there's something in that that goes in the direction of being able to indicate some aspects of disability, but it's nowhere near as comprehensive as it can or should be to really unpack those dynamics. Um, there is some research that's taken place on refugees and disability, um, but I think actually from what I know of, it's an area that probably needs additional work um, and additional thought from people who come from, from that area of research on the disability and health side, rather than from the refugee and forced migration studies side, where there's, there's often the gap in expertise. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for that's a great question, Gemma. And uh, Genevieve. Um, thank you very much for all that. I, um, I, there wasn't anything in that that I disagreed with. And in fact, I was really, really pleased to, to see the basis that you'd covered. 
and the implications that you picked up. Uh, what I would like to contribute is um, the way that um, people who've already been uh, accepted into the country, um, in the first case accepted as full citizens, uh, having gone through the procedure as well, where the where the husband was being employed uh, 12 hours 12 hours a day for six days a week and being paid half the basic minimum pay um, living in one room with a newborn baby and rats coming into the kitchen and things like that and then um, more recently an, an Iranian who has been given leave to remain um, and her first two attempts at employment, um, the, first, the first one uh, she started didn't, didn't know about getting, you know, paperwork and stuff like that, um, but she started and then the employer said that she, she would start to pay her at the end of the month, um, that it would be free for the first month. <laughs> Um, and then the, the following one was her following employment was very similar um, that he was expecting her to volunteer. Um, and um, so, yeah, I mean, it, it's the whole procedure of, of people. Um, I, I'm, I'm in contact with the refugee who's been here. Um, now 22 years and he's been waiting uh, for uh, back from the home office for for a couple of years now um, it, it, it's 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 appalling because the the drain on other people uh, and the drain on the economy um, is is huge yeah yeah thanks for those insights um Genevieve I guess the question really is how you know the internal processes once people are here you might have these amazing well you might have a, a, a process of getting them here and people can get asylum but uh, and I'll, I'll ask a related question about changing the narrative but maybe you could just comment on Genevieve's um, uh, insights and, and question there Alex. Yeah it's it's a really important um, but also harry harrowing story and, and all too common um, I mean I think in the UK um, over years the government has tried to create a hostile environment to use Theresa May's terms and it's done that by reducing over time um, the amount of support that people get their access to public services their access to rights and I mean it's a, it's a really difficult position to be an asylum seeker in the UK because the level of support the quality of housing is is extremely limited and basically unlivable um, and even then you've got a time lag before you're allowed the right to work. So we unbelievably exclude asylum seekers from being able to work. We, we criticize them for relying upon assistance, and yet we criticize them when they try to work and prevent them from doing so. And even after that time lag, there are only limited sectors in which they're allowed to work. So there needs to be a shift um, in allowing asylum seekers to work from the start. Um, this is something where there is a real movement and push amongst more progressive MPs at the moment to try to get that right to work for asylum seekers, but where the government is basically blocking that and, and blocked um, amendments to the, the current bill to that effect. Um, I think where social scientists can contribute is actually showing that these policies have no deterrent effect and that they're really harmful. So the government is prepared to tolerate huge harm in the name of deterrence, to say to people, OK, Britain is not a soft touch and actually you should think about going to France or Italy or Germany or Greece instead of coming here. And if you're genuinely, genuinely a refugee, then you'll like it or lump it and we shouldn't have to feed you properly or give you decent access to public service. So I think the more we can showcase demonstrate these horrible cases and shame the government into seeing them as well the better but i also think it's very important that we try to confront the deterrent narrative that making people miserable doesn't deter desperate people it just makes them miserable and desperate 
and that far from being a source of political support by the tabloid newspapers, it should be a source of public shame that we make people live in these conditions. Yeah. Um, again, I'm, I'm going to come back to, you know, how we can change the narrative at, at all levels. That seems so difficult to do. We seem in this very entrenched hostile environment at local, regional, you know, and, and national level. But there's a question about um, coming back to the measures, um, Alex. What did you focus on in terms of indicators and factors for social co cohesion? How, how were you defining that? I think that's of interest yeah. to a lot of people, actually. So social cohesion is an interesting concept because it's it's been critiqued as, as vague and challenging and there are challenges around uh, endogeneity and causality. We were really focusing on attitudes. So we're really focusing on host community attitudes uh, towards refugees and refugees' attitudes towards host communities. Um, and we looked at attitudes in a series of areas, um, attitudes in terms of economic contribution, attitudes in terms of security and threat, attitudes towards culture and identity, and attitudes towards refugee rights, for instance. And what was really interesting about the work was we were also documenting frequency and quality of interactions, business interactions, conversations, um, shared social engagement, shared participation in sports activities, for instance, to be able to look at the correlation really between attitudes and interactions. And that's sort of how we designed that space. Now, there are many ways to think about social cohesion beyond attitudes and interactions, but those were the areas that we wanted to focus on just to begin to do a little bit of work in that area. Um, so the, the book discusses it a little bit, but we've got, um, We've got an article specifically on that that is um, currently revised and resubmit with world development. So hopefully that might come out in the next decade. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, OK, if there's no more questions. I'm just going to um, ask one of my own. There's, I've looked lots uh, at Alex and the book is fantastic. I would really recommend it. I don't think that we can often say that an academic textbook is a page turner, but it is a page turner and it's brilliantly written, um, Alex. And the underpinning research that goes alongside it is, is fascinating as well from the participatory to the, to the quant. Uh, what strikes me about the whole agenda is the relevance of the narrative around refugees, which seems wholly negative mostly, and yet you're you know, seeking to turn that on its head, and that it's stigma and fear uh, that people hold that shapes that narrative. And, uh, you know, I, I think that this, the work, the, the stuff on attitudes and social cohesion might be one way to break into trying to understand how we change that narrative, because I think it is people's attitudes shape their behaviours. And, you know, there's sort of this, like you say, this contagious approach. But, but I, just a final comment for you about how we really do try and change the narrative around the negativity that people have towards refugees. And I think UK is a classic example. Like you said, we have tiny numbers of refugees coming here and yet a huge view that, that they bring nothing. So I don't have a perfect answer, but it's it's an area where I, I really wrestle with it. And, and you can probably sense that in the book. It's a real challenge to know if you're going to engage, how much do you kind of hold constant of where people are? How much do you kind of go, OK, government's responses are negative. Therefore, we've got to design policies and programmes that are as good as they can be given those limitations. Or to what extent do we say this is really unacceptable? Um, the narrative has got to shift. We've got to move people's opinions, to move the politicians, to change the politics, to change the policies. And I kind of think it's, it needs to be both, right? We need to engage with what we've got and try and channel that into the best possible outcomes given the constraints. But we shouldn't accept those narratives. We should also push them and challenge them. Um, and again, I come at that as a researcher thinking, what's the evidence that we need to mobilize to shift attitudes, but I also come at it with a recognition that evidence by itself isn't going to be enough, that it needs to be evidence plus human stories, plus probably a degree of enlightened self-interest. So there are a range of policies that I think can really help. So often, as I described in Uganda, Ethiopia, Kenya, refugee support will also try to benefit the host communities. Now, we don't follow that always in Europe. And often it's those communities that perceive themselves to be most affected by 
in the past the dispersal of asylum seekers towards already um, socioeconomically challenged communities that end up with with negative attitudes. Um, often it's communities in the UK that have been affected by deindustrialization, or communities in Germany or the US affected by deindustrialization, where the narrative of um, asylum and immigration is so much easier to mobilize as a scapegoat than to describe major structural change in the global economy. Um, the fact that offshoring um, and the rise of China have affected your economic opportunities is much harder for politicians to describe than to say it's all about migration in the EU. Mm. Um, and so I think we need to think about what the evidence is that can engage people in a non-elitist way to understand that what they're being told is false and that what they're being told is not in their interests. Mm. Now, we know from so many other policy fields that that's really hard, mm. that people can vote for things that are not only unethical, but self-harming. Um, and so I struggle with that question of what are the shifts that can happen? Now, I hope there are some sort of clues in the research we've done yeah. in the talks that, for instance, contact theory, getting interaction, allowing people to interact with people different from them matters. The areas of not only our country, but also Germany voting for alternative before Deutschland, the vote for Donald Trump in the United States, where you have the greatest anti-immigration sentiment tend to be those with the fewest migrants. Hmm. And those with the greatest diversity tend to have the most positive attitudes. Hmm. In the UK, it's, it's London and the Southeast. Um, and there are other areas of the country that are much less diverse, where there are negative attitudes to immigration, but they've been affected by deindustrialization. They've been socioeconomically affected and politicians have fed them a particular narrative. So I think we've got to call out politicians on that, that what, what's significant is People's sense of precarity is real. We've got to acknowledge that. People's sense of um, upheaval as a result of structural economic change and the, the end of kind of full structural employment, that's real. But we've got to articulate the real causes of it. We've got to recognize as well that refugees and migration can be part of the solution. Um, that um, the gaps in our labor markets are areas where British citizens are not filling them, um, where asylum and immigration can be routes to filling those gaps, where we've got to acknowledge our daily hypocrisies, that the, 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 the takeaways and restaurants we go to are often only available because of the kind of cultural diversity we have in all of our communities across the country. Um, I think things like sports, music, and the arts can be really powerful because they create those common human connections. Um, it's very difficult for anyone to say, um, I don't like Alfonso Davies, the Bayern Munich player, mm -hmm. or I don't like Mo Farah, the elite runner who happens to have arrived from Somalia in his youth. Um, so I think those connections that allow people to recognize that Rita Ora came from Kosovo as a refugee, they're often ways of connecting on a common human basis. Mm -hmm. And Academic research has a role to play, but I think as a researcher, we need to be a bit, have a bit of humility about where it fits alongside other things that change the narrative. Um, I mean, one of the things I'm doing at the moment is working with um, a variety of people from the NGO sector and um, within government on a, a sort of model, it's not gonna be adopted, but a model British refugee policy, what could it look like? Mm -hmm. And it's designed to shift the narrative, but also be as inclusive as possible and, not kind of engage in party politics, but trying to transcend it a little bit by being values and evidence-based. Brilliant, good luck. Uh, <laughs> um, listen, um, to, okay, so one final question. Um, what do you think about labour migration as a de facto durable solution for refugees? Um, I, so I can give you quite a nuanced answer. In general though, I, I think it's positive. I think when I mentioned alternative pathways, I was thinking about other visa routes, um, migration for labor, family reunification, education. Um, I think the idea that it has to be a humanitarian form of resettlement that locates people from camps and cities around the world to countries like ours is unnecessary. Um, if you can get access to a labor migration visa, provided all your other rights are met, it's a great route to building a new life, to being able to support yourself and your family 
Um, we've got great schemes in the UK that are being piloted. Um, Talent Beyond Boundaries is a non-profit organization that is working, this is at the better end of UK policy with the Home Office to pilot a scheme to get refugee health workers from the Middle East into certain NHS trusts. So I think it's on Merseyside where a, a significant number of nurses have moved from the Middle East, particularly Palestinian refugees, and are working within the NHS. And that's something that the government feels positively about, is something that will benefit our National Health Service and creates opportunities for those people. Now, of course, what you've got to avoid is leaving behind those that are not seen as an economic benefit, the most vulnerable. What you've also got to avoid is labour market exploitation. What you've got to avoid is undermining people's rights as refugees. But I think those things that can be done, those things that, things that can be done compatibly with the idea of labour migration as a durable solution. Brilliant, Alex. I'm going to leave it there. I just a huge thanks. Everyone has um, thoroughly enjoyed it. it it's been um, insightful. On obviously, the work you've been doing over the long term is outstanding, Alex. So thank you for bringing that to us. Good luck with wherever this goes. I know we'll be talking about other things at other times, um, but thank you so much. And thanks to everyone here for the questions, the comments. Um, for listening and engaging. It's been a brilliant start to the week for our research festival. We will make, as long as you're okay with it, Alex, we can share it with you. We'll make, we'll, we intend to make this um, uh, available as a recording and we'll let people know. Um, and you can see what people think in the chat there, Alex. So thank you very much for everyone. Have a great rest of your day and mm. do engage with some of the research festival events. Take care. Thanks, Louise. And enjoy the rest of the festival. Yeah, brilliant. Thanks a million.